Volleyball put on a show against the Kansas Jayhawks at DKR. Texas Volleyball experienced a doubleheader against the top contender, and the NFL has some star quarterbacks in the works. All this and more coming up on College Press Box. Good evening and welcome to College Press Box. I'm your host, Jamie Tanguma, and she's Janelle Tanguma. And no, you're not seeing double, unless you are and there's four of us. We have a great show for you today. Thanks, Jamie. Today's show is brought to you by Cap Metro Austin Transit System. We connect you to work, school, play, and everywhere in between. Plan your ride, ride to this weekend's game at capmetro.org. Let's just dive right into it. This weekend, the number three ranked Longhorns face the number 24 ranked Kansas Jayhawks. With both teams being ranked and undefeated, we were expecting a showdown at DKR Stadium as both teams battled it out to see who would get their first loss of the season. The Longhorns started the game strong on the offense with Quinn Ewers going in for the run and taking off all the way for the 30 yard touchdown. He has proven to be fast on his feet this, this season. And as if his running game wasn't strong enough, he's showing that he's a dual threat with a pass to Xavier Worthy down the field. Worthy would get a first down on that one. The Longhorns tried for a pass to the end zone, but it was incomplete and they settled for the 26 yard field goal from Burt Auburn. Now Kansas with the ball and trying to make a big play, their QB will run it up the field and fumble near the 20 yard line where it's recovered and brought in for a touchdown by Kansas. The score is now 10-7. Texas with the ball again, and this time Ewers hands it off to running back Jonathan Brooks, and he is going to take off down the field into Kansas territory. His speed has the Kansas defense trailing behind him. He nearly gets the ball punched out, but he holds on to it near the end zone. What a great run by the sophomore starter. Jonathan Brooks again carries it in, this time for a 54-yard touchdown Sarkeesian has looked to him a lot during this game to make big plays against this Kansas defense. The score is now 20 to seven, Texas. In the third quarter with the Jayhawks trailing by six, Ewers turns to Brooks again to run it in for the one yard touchdown. That's his second touchdown of the game. At the start of the fourth, Ewers finds his receiver Adonai Mitchell in the end zone for his first touchdown of the game. And he'll give us a little cel celebration for that one. Texas leads at the end, 40 to 14, with their biggest players being Ewers, Brooks, and Mitchell with the touchdowns. The sights and sounds are like no other at DKR. Smoke, music blasting, and fans cheering. This was a tale of two halves. Kansas's QB1 Jalen Daniels sat out for the entire game due to tightness in his back in pre-game warm-ups, while the second string quarterback, Jason Bean, was in in his place. Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers was speedy on his feet while being confident and ran for a 30-yard touchdown. And place kicker Burt Auburn kicked a 26-yard field goal. Overall, Texas was able to hold Kansas back on the defensive end. The second quarter ended with Texas up 13-7. But in the second half, the ball game completely changed. Texas shifted focus after a quarter-ending interception and being up by a touchdown. The run game was outstanding. Quinn Ewers had gained confidence while he had 40 rushing yards and also made two touchdowns himself. Jonathan Brooks was also a key aspect to this game, with 218 rushing yards and two touchdowns. Texas head coach Steve Sarkeesian touched on how Brooks had improved this season. Well, uh, again... Uh... I think one thing that JB's doing, he's playing with a lot of confidence. Um, you know, I think that he's a very patient runner. He's always had natural running ability. And now as he's finding opportunities in the open field, he's making safeties miss. Uh, and when you can do that at running back, when you block things right and you trust the run, and then you can make that last layer of defense miss, you can create explosive runs. This game allowed Texas to get a 5-0 and start so far this season. Sarkeesian also commented on the outcome. So, 
uh, all in all, um, I'm proud of the guys. It was a heck of a win against a good football team. The number three Texas Longhorns beat the number 24 Kansas Jayhawks 40 to 14. Texas put up over 600 total offensive yards. Next week, Texas takes on Oklahoma at the Cotton Bowl. Reporting for TSTV Sports, I'm Samantha Pearl. Joining us now to talk Longhorn football is our college football analyst, Zach Davis. Welcome to the show, Zach. Glad to be here. The Texas Longhorns are now 5-0 and after routing Kansas in DKR. Coming in, Kansas was undefeated and had impressive wins against BYU and Illinois. How did Texas manage to win by 26, and who had the biggest impact on the game? Yeah, I mean, Sarkeesian and his Longhorns grabbed their second double-digit win against a top-25 team this season and did it convincingly, might I say. Kansas was great coming into the game, sitting at 4-0, just like the Horns, and just squeaked into the rankings at 24. Jayhawk fans received poor news minutes before kickoff as their starting quarterback, Jalen Daniels, was dealing with a tweak in his back. They had to roll with Jason Beam, who could not get the offense rolling. On the other side of the ball, Quinn looked great which seems to be coming the norm for him. Throwing for 325 yards with one touchdown and interception, he distributed the ball great, throwing for 25 completions on 35 attempts to eight different receivers. A.D. Mitchell led in receiving yards, grabbing 10 passes for 141 yards, and also getting in the end zone as well. Ewer's 15-pound weight loss over the offseason is starting to show as his run game is improving, running for 40 yards on seven attempts and getting in the end zone twice. In the backfield, Jonathan Brooks had his breakout game pounding the rock for over 200 yards on only 21 attempts, getting in the end zone twice himself. Jonathan Brooks, Quinn Ewers, and A.D. Mitchell all played great this past Saturday, and I'm excited to see what they do in the Cotton Bowl next week. I'm glad you brought that up, Zach, as there's a lot at stake in the Longhorns game against Oklahoma next Saturday mm -hmm. in the infamous Red River Showdown. What should we be looking out for in that game this upcoming weekend, and what's at stake for both of these teams? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot at stake with this upcoming game for both teams. Number three ranked Texas and number 12 ranked Oklahoma are both coming in at an undefeated 5-0. and oh. The Red River Showdown is always entertaining, and with the spot both of these schools have put themselves into, there's more at stake this year compared to past seasons. Both of these schools have the chance to go to the college football playoff, with the Big 12 also not being very competitive this year. I would not be surprised if both of these teams play in Kansas City for the Big 12 title as well. Regardless, whoever wins this game is poised to play for the conference championship and be set up for a college football playoff spot. And both of these teams will know this going into Dallas. As far as these two heavyweights Matt, as, as far as these two heavyweights go, both offenses are very high powered. Oklahoma is averaging 47.4 points per game, and Texas has not gone a game scoring less than 30. I know we say defense wins championships, Jamie, but defenses have not proven to stop either of these programs, and I would not expect that to become the case on Saturday. I expect high scoring with Texas's Quinn Ewers and Oklahoma's Dylan Gabriel to combine for seven or so touchdown passes. There's so much at stake, so much riding on these programs coming into this weekend, and both teams are going to come out firing. A high scoring game should be exciting for everyone in Dallas. Texas hasn't been 5-0 and at the start of the season since 2009. Going forward, do you see any of the teams on the schedule that could disrupt this win streak for the Longhorns? Yeah, Jamie, absolutely. There's a couple of games I've circled on the Longhorns schedule besides Oklahoma this season. Texas has a tough back-to-back -back next month in weeks 10 and 11, playing Kansas State at home and then TCU in Fort Worth. Kansas State, in my opinion, is a team very under the radar in FBS at the moment. They took a three-point loss at Missouri, now ranked 21st in the country, and took them down to the last possession. They are currently averaging 44 points per game and rank 15th in total yards at 482.3. Even though the game is in DKR, Texas will have to match the Wildcats' offensive efficiency and improve the level of their defense they have shown so far. I would not be surprised if Kansas State played the Longhorns close or possibly even won in DKR, dare I say, in front of Longhorn Nation. The following week, Texas might also be in trouble as well. Sarkeesian and his team will head to Fort Worth to play a very exciting team in the TCU Horned Frogs. TCU has given Austin trouble in the past, winning in DKR last year, and on top of that, winning seven of their last 10 matchups with Texas. TCU ranks 14th in total offensive yards, and their quarterback, Chandler Morris, has been playing excellent throwing for 11 touchdowns on only three interce interceptions thus far. OU isn't the only monster in the way of the Longhorns. Expect both the Wildcats of, of Kansas State and TCU to give problems to Texas later in this season. 
Always great to hear your analysis. When we come back to College Press Box, Justin Todd will break down the recent play of the Texas volleyball team. So don't go, go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to College Press Box. Now joining us is our volleyball analyst, Justin Todd. Justin, thanks for joining us. Always glad to be here. Love to talk volleyball on Press Box. Mm -hmm. This past week had a huge doubleheader at home against number nine BYU. How do you think the Cougars performed? Yeah, these games were super hard fought. I mean, BYU went in ranked number nine and Texas at 10, so we knew that it could go either way. I'm really proud of this Texas team for pulling out both games in four sets. But focusing on BYU, they are a tough team on both the offensive side and the defensive side of the ball. They have cannons on both pins in Pryor and Livingston, and Livingston took 55 swings on Thursday. They both have high contact points and deadly power. BYU's most important weapon, however, is their senior setter, Whitney Bauer, who is super crafty and dangerous with the dump. Even at 5'9", she was a particularly effective weapon in the front row. And even if she can't get the kill herself, her 6'3 sister on the outside is a pretty great option. They block really well on the pins, and I was super excited to see how Texas's pin hitters would respond. Yeah, I'm sure it was a great game to watch. So what did you see in the games from this Texas team? Well, first off, I want to highlight who I think has become a crucial member of this Texas team, Bella Bergmark. She looked amazing in these games, particularly on Friday. She is just the definition of reliable. 10 kills on Friday, and that is a huge number when you're swinging from the middle. Very few errors, not blocked often, and incredibly precise and powerful. Her and O'Neill are the rocks of this team, which has proven to be pretty streaky this season. And running with that, Texas had a really rough start on Thursday. In the first set, they lost 12 straight points, and they trailed 22 to 6 at one point in the set, hitting negative 192 with four kills and nine errors. That is not something that a championship team can afford to do in a more clutch situation. So it scares me for the playoffs. Nonetheless, they flipped the script and won sets two to four to take the first game. And looking to the Friday contest, Texas convincingly won in four sets. Jenna Winnis kicked her power up a gear. I saw some amazing, hard-driven shots from her on Friday. And I look forward to seeing her connection with Swindle improve as the season goes on. In addition, the serving looked amazing. I've been waiting for it all season, and it is there. It's aggressive, it puts on immediate pressure, and it was very effective against BYU. So I hope to see a similar level in the future. I totally agree with that. Speaking of the future, what can this team do to improve as we continue with Big 12 Conference play? Well, it's worth being said that the team keeps getting better and better every week, but there are a few things that could still be improved. Particularly on Thursday, the passing was pretty hit or miss. The offense relies on the pass, being where Swindle has the option of setting the middles, who are the most effective hitters on the team. When the passes are off, she's forced to set outside, and the blockers all know it, making it that much harder to end the point. So in future games, I would love to see the main passing trio of Halter, Akanya, and Barnes more consistently putting serve-receive on point. In addition, one thing that that would flesh out uh, is Texas's offense for Ella Swindle's back sets. I mean, her back sets have not really been where they need to be uh, from off the net, so getting a little bit more consistent with that would really help the team more consistently have two options from a bad place, maybe if the ball was a little bit far from the net. And I mean, the threat alone of having two hitters is enough for the defense to be slowed down, the blockers to take a little bit more time to get there. And at the end of the day, this team is getting better and better. So I have no doubt that they have a shot to go all the way. That sounds exciting. Thank you for your in-depth analysis, Justin. When we return on College Press Box, Robert Gonsolin will break down the NFL. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to College Press Box. Now, now joining us to talk about the NFL is Robert Gonsolin. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's good to be back. Well, Robert, we're already four weeks into the NFL regular season, and many teams are shaping out better than others. This is part because of the great performances quarterbacks have put on. So to start us off, which QBs lead the way right now? Well, it's tough to say which quarterbacks are the best right now, but I can tell you who's helped their teams the most. Tua Tagovailoa, Josh Allen, and C.J. Stroud. Focusing in on the Dolphins, Tua is leading the league in passing with over 1,300 yards and has completed a stellar 97% of his attempts. He's led his team to a 3 and one start, tied for first place in the AFC East. The Dolphins are already on pace to surpass their record from last year, and it's all thanks to Tua's delivery. Well, mostly. We have to give credit to his amazing receiving core in Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell, but still, he's putting up his end of the job. Yes, I know I just praised Tua after the loss yesterday. I know I just did that, but this next quarterback I'm about to feature, I think we can let it slide. Josh Allen, with an 89 QB rating in yesterday's matchup, he threw for four touchdowns and 320 yards. Also, no interceptions there. Where, where has that brought his team? Also tied for first place in the AFC East. And then the rookie, the former Buckeye for the Houston, from the Houston Texans, C.J. Stroud. He just gave Houston their first home win since 2021 and turned around an 0-2 team to an even 500. He just set the record for most pass attempts without throwing a single interception. That number is 151. For all the Houston fans out there, yesterday definitely felt like a lot different than it has been in the past few seasons, and well, that's a good feeling. Okay, so we know who's playing well. What about the flip side? Right. While there have been many rookies shining, there are also some who have, had a rookie, who have had a rockier start. Last season, we clearly thought Justin Fields, not a rookie, but a, a second-year guy, we thought he'd be Chicago's go-to guy, despite finishing in last place. But now, they're facing an 0-4 start. Don't get me wrong, I'm clearly rooting for Fields, but he's throwing an interception every game this season. And for the rest of his team, they just lost to one of the worst teams in the league yesterday, the Broncos. Now, I know only one of those first four games had a score difference of less than 10 points, so he's not the only one to blame. But if you're a Chicago fan, you have to hope he steps up a little bit more this week. And now, let's talk about veteran Russell Wilson. He has always been great in Seattle, but something's just not clicking for him ever since he moved to Denver to play for the Broncos. The team they beat yesterday was the previously mentioned Chicago Bears. It's not about the starts or the weapons delivery here. I just think it's a mojo issue for Wilson. Truly, I think Wilson is a great quarterback. It's that I don't think he's quite found his groove since coming to the Broncos. Justin Fields and Russell Wilson are two great quarterbacks with tremendous talent. I just think they need to rediscover their swagger, which could help push the rest of their teams to turn it around a little bit more, and I'm rooting for them. And finally, Robert, who's the quarterback we should be keeping our eyes on right now? The answer to this one is clear to me, maybe not to everyone else, but it's Zach Wilson. Not because of the pressure he's had ever since Rodgers got hurt, but the strides he's already made since taking over the starting job. After beating the Bills on primetime in week one, he's led the team to two losses that were by only less than 10 points. The other loss was to the Cowboys, and well, with how good they are this season, that's pretty self-explanatory. But Zach Wilson is still putting up the numbers, even on a team where its fan base was expecting a different quarterback to be playing this year. Over 150 passing yards in each of the last three starts and no interceptions after the three he threw against the Cowboys in week two. On Sunday, they play the Broncos, which I think will be a somewhat even matchup for him to showcase his talent and for people to see how good he really is. That's it for me, so let's bump back to Longhorn Sports in a little bit. Thank you for that, as always, Robert. When we return, we recap last week in Texas sports. You won't want to miss it. Welcome back to College Press Box. Let's take a look at some of the headlines regarding Longhorn athletes. ESPN's College Game Day is coming to Allstate Red River Rivalry to meet the number three ranked Longhorns versus the number 12 ranked Oklahoma Sooners for the long-standing Red River Rivalry in Dallas, Texas. The Cotton Bowl will be played as part of the annual State Fair of Texas and will be the ninth ESPN Game Day for a Texas-Oklahoma matchup. 
Number 21, soccer's justice records seventh clean sheet after the goalless game Thursday night against West Virginia. Texas goalkeeper Mia Justice becomes one of only seven goalkeepers in program history to be credited with seven or more clean sheets in a single season. Lucky number sevens offered this Texas goalkeeper some good luck. Scheffler and Spieth compete in Ryder Cup for Team USA. The former University of Texas stars Scotty Scheffler and Jordan Spieth are set to represent Team USA at the 44th Ryder Cup on Friday at the Marco Simone Golf and Country Club. This marks the second straight Ryder Cup for the pair of former Longhorns to play for Team USA. Let's take a look at the week ahead in Longhorn sports. On Wednesday, softball versus UTSA at 7.30 on Longhorn Network. Then again on Thursday, soccer at UCF at 4.30 on ESPNU. And then volleyball versus Kansas at CF 7 p.m. on Longhorn Network. On Saturday, football versus Oklahoma at 11 a.m. and that will be aired on ABC. That'll wrap things up for this week's episode of College Press Box. Make sure to tune in to our other shows this week, including College Crossfire on Wednesday and 1-0 Sports on Friday. Thank you to our analysts, everyone in Masters Control, our executive producer Jason Canander, and everyone else at TSTV. I'm Janelle Thanguma. She's Jamie Thanguma. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.